What are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time? All right, Sikinder, I want to start at a specific moment in your career. And this may surprise you, but I know you've, I've heard you talk about this on a stage before. Mm -hmm. So there was a time when you were working at Google mm -hmm. and you walked into Eric Schmidt's office mm -hmm. and you said, quote, I'm pregnant, but I want to keep running our international business at Google. I need for you to pay for me and my nanny to travel the world business class. And they said, yes. And I love this story because it's a big ask, but you have to know at that point that you've earned it. Can you take us inside that room, what you were thinking and how you had the guts to make that big ask? Sure. Well, first of all, I want to make sure the story is entirely accurate and sometimes you get translated. I actually asked Omid Kordestani, my boss, who okay. also talked to Eric, um, but Eric was aware. My, my boss was the chief business officer and, and obviously I had a lot of exposure to Eric Schmidt, our CEO. He was kind enough to do uh, the endorsement for my book, but, yeah. but it was Eric and Omid and, and you know, Omid, I was who I asked and Eric was definitely aware and supportive. Um, so what's going through my head at that moment, and many of you know this, as we um, have the good fortune to, you know, ascend in our careers if we do good work. Well, I've been married a year. I'm 20, I'm 34 years old, 35 years old, um, and I'm pregnant. And I've just been in this job. I, you know, I came to Google to run local and maps and be the first kind of leader there. But I'd moved over to run international, and my my territories were from China all the way to Brazil. So we used to call that rest of world. And then I changed the name to Asia Pacific and Latin America. So what's going through my mind is like, I don't want to give up this job. I'm a year into this job, mm -hmm. but like, my God, like, I don't want to leave a baby at home. What am I going to do? Um, and so you're right. I, I could not think of a way to make it work that was going to work for my family. And by the way, even then at home, I negotiate with my husband to be like, this is what I'm going to ask for at work. But that means that you have to be okay, that we're disappearing for two, two and a half weeks at a time, I'm going to take our daughter with me, which he wasn't particularly happy about, but he supported it. Mm -hmm. If I can get Google to say yes. Cause, and, um, and I went into that room, I wouldn't say trepidatious, but I went into that room knowing two things. Number one, by the way, this is a huge ask to go in there and be arrogant about it would be a sin. I'm mm -hmm. like, nobody needs to say yes to this. But at the same time, time doing the calculus that I've been working hard. I think I'm well thought of. I realized that for me to switch out and quit the job is also really painful for Google because I'm just getting going here. Like we're a year into, you know, building this business. And so that calculus is like, what do I have to lose by asking? And again, I, um, I definitely give a lot of kudos to Google to saying, yes, they did the calculus too and decided that, you know, maybe my work and having me in that leadership role was worth it. Um, and that's how, that's how we rolled for my- How'd it go then once uh, you actually did it? I would say it went, uh, I'll tell you the things that overall went well, overall went well. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was very binary. I mean, we were on or off and my daughter, I think became an amazing traveler. She doesn't remember it now, but she went to every country like China, Korea. We lived in Hong Kong for two and a half months and my family came to visit India, like Brazil, she did all of it. So wow. I think she was quite flexible as a result though she doesn't remember that like she was literally uh, on a plane for the first two and a half years of her life. Um, <laughs> But interestingly, I'll tell you, the thing that people say to me the most in hindsight, and I appreciate this now, is that like my daughter showed up with me everywhere, sales conferences, you know, like everywhere. Um, people chuckle because we had a sales conference in China when I was five and a half months pregnant and I hiked up the Great Wall. And people are always like, Sukinder, I remember that you walked up the Great Wall when you were five and a half months pregnant. And I'm like, well, I don't really, I didn't think that that was that big a deal at the time. But people were like, the fact that you showed up and you did it, like we were impressed. But then like everywhere I showed up, I think that the, my organization understood that like, mm -hmm. it's okay to show up as your full self at work. Like if that's what it takes to make it work, so be it. Um, so I think I, I, I achieved some degree of notoriety, but I hope more importantly, some degree of respect for being transparent about my desire to be both a, like a mom and just trying to do my best to figure out a situation, 
um, and like a full-fledged leader. Like I am not giving up my ambition on this role and I'm going to find a way to make it work. And so um, I think it ended up having maybe an appreciable difference and more than I realized at the time in signaling to other people what's possible. Not that everybody uh, needs to want that, by the way. Sure, That's sure. Cool. Yeah. That, you know, uh, maybe that it was possible for themselves. Yeah, I, I just like the, the thought that you didn't set a limitation, right? You, you thought like, okay, I'm going to make a big ask, but there's a, I'm going to have a justifiable reason for this ask. And then you had the guts and you went and did it. And I think that's really hard. And now I have to believe you have, you're very glad that you did, as opposed to taking another route, because you probably learned so much through that time. And, and what a cool experience for you and your daughter, even though she doesn't remember it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I want to get into So I want to talk a lot about taking risk and thriving even when you fail because I think that's that's a big part of your story it's a big part that's what your book is about uh, which is called choose possibility but prior to that one second I, when I was studying your career arc and the places you've gone and, and just kind of going from place to place it's really remarkable and it's worth talking about briefly even though I don't normally do this because as I see things and, I'll, and I know I'll miss places purposely along the way but you go to Merrill Lynch, you move to London, mm -hmm. right? Then at one point you're in within startups, you're starting businesses, you're getting acquired, you get acquired, your business gets acquired by Amazon. So then you go work at Amazon in the earlier days, right? Mm -hmm. You work at Google, you become president at StubHub, you, and there's other things amidst all this happening to other parts that I've skipped. A wild career arc and trajectory. Can you kind of summarize that I just be curious to hear how you viewed it the choices you made like the decisions is why you've made from place to place because it's a pretty cool pretty cool linear path at least it seems like that on paper but you're the one who lived it I'd be curious to hear your story of your career there sure so first and foremost the most important thing is it's not linear and you know what the problem is People look at my career, or maybe the career of people they consider successful, and it looks linear because you see the points in time that everybody remembers. Right, right exactly. And I'm the first person to tell you it was cyclical. And I think that's mm. a really key point when we make choices. When we believe it's linear, we actually um, potentially don't take the risks we should because mm. we perceive other people are peak jumping. One big choice, another big choice, another big choice. Wow, these guys must be the riskiest people in the world and the best risk takers because they just move from like strength to strength to strength. And often what we're missing, because this is just the way the hero's journey works, and all you all remember, everybody remembers it in hindsight is the big choice. Mm -hmm. But in between what's going on is big and little choices, some of which deliver and some of which do not. And I think that's such, and so the arc of my career has been cyclical, not linear. And I think that's really an important thing for people to remember when they're what, is, what does that mean? What does cyclical mean? It means in that it regard? has ups and downs. In fact, I mapped in the book, I made 13 different meaningful choices over the last 25 years. And some were little choices that produced big outcomes. Some were big outcomes, big choices that produced complete failures. Some were big choices that I, that produced little outcomes. I mean, like if I were to map it for you, what you would see is it's big and little choices the correlation between any single choice and the size of the outcome is not what you would expect, but strung together cumulatively, there is an up into the right pattern. Mm. So when you say cyclical, I mean, like if you caught any single choice, I will tell you the correlation between the risk and the reward was completely unobvious, completely. Mm. Um, and, and that's part of the myth we have in our heads, right? So so when I say my career is cyclical, well, you can think of it as roughly I've been building everywhere I've been, and that gives me joy. Um, roughly, I've made decisions and choices based on taking risks, not just to achieve an ambition, but to learn or to uh, learning has been a big theme of when I've taken risks. Um, and then there've been some other kind of um, things that are important, but I've taken risks to build, to build small companies from scratch or to help you know, companies that were small get bigger disproportionately fast, right? So mm. Google, you know, I got, I, I got to join a company and learn and like, and I basically bet on the fact that I thought Google had tailwinds to its business. And then starting completely from scratch businesses where you have to create all the momentum yourself and you're looking around the world and say, well, I think this is a good idea because what I perceive is that I'm making it up. 
people are going to want more control of their financial wealth. Oh, well, this company comes along, you know, called Yodley, one of my first startups, and it does that. So my career could be sum up, summarized as cyclical. Um, single risk, single reward, hard to find the correlation. You will see the correlation is in the frequency of risk and reward, meaning many choices to unlock a reward. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the reward was what I thought, and sometimes it wasn't. Um, and always building. Always, always building. building. Okay, because building is like what that's that's what lights you up. That's what fulfills you. It gives me joy. It's a great use of you, my energy. Of of those thirteen, could you share an example or two? Sure. Um, uh, so let me uh, share one big example to the positive and one big example to the negative. Perfect. So you talked about the fact that I went to you know I was at Merrill Lynch, I was in New York, and then in London as an investment banker, and I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. My dad always was like, be an entrepreneur. I didn't know what, I didn't know how. Um, and I'm in London and I'm restless. I've been there two and a half years. I'm getting lonely. I want to be an entrepreneur. I don't know how. So I quit my job and I went skiing at Whistler for about a month because I wanted to like learn how to ski. So I went from zero to hero as a skier. And then I moved to California. I like, hung out in LA for two weeks thinking like, hey, two to three weeks, thinking maybe I want to be in television because I was at, you know, uh, I was at B Sky B right before. Um, but I ultimately had fallen in love with the Bay Area because I saw all these entrepreneurial people. I saw this great lifestyle. I saw great weather. And so I drive my car up the coast from LA to San Francisco and I find a job at a startup. And so what, what are the lessons in that? But number one, I chose to be proximate to entrepreneurship when I didn't know what it meant. So I just basically was like, I'm going to move here and figure it out. Okay. So people would be that. And, and by the way, you say, well, it's a big risk because you quit a job and you moved continents. And I, I would say that was actually relatively small risk because I was responsible only for myself. I had some savings. I had 10 grand in the bank and I knew I was employable. And I knew if I wasn't employable, I had the benefit of having parents who would, you know, support me if I needed, if you were Were you scared? Um, I wasn't really scared, but, no. but that's because, but that's because to me, to me, it was judged as a little risk. And in hindsight, it was, I wasn't responsible for family, responsible for myself. And like I said, I had, my backup plan was like my parents, if I had to go move home for six months, I can do it. Right. Like I, yeah. so, so I always think of that as a little risk though. People would say, well, that was a big career risk because you left a job and you went to nothing. And I would say, well, if you know, you're employable and you know that you have financial security from your parents or something else, a place to live and a roof over your head and food. I'd say that's not a big risk, but other people would say it was. But that risk turned out to the positive for two reasons. Number one, I chose to get proximate to entrepreneurship to learn about entrepreneurship. And that's how I got my own first startup opportunity. To your point, I joined a company, got sold to Amazon as a startup. And I met um, the founders of that company went on to become angel investors. And I got the opportunity to co-found my own company as a result. That's one to the positive. But the second reason that that decision was successful had nothing to do with me. And people think that when we take risks, it's all about us. And I'm like, I moved to Silicon Valley in 1997. If I showed you the graph of internet usage um, as a chart and what happened, you know, starting in about 1997 is internet usage globally started to accelerate. So I just rode one of those most macro tailwinds of all time. So people were like, well, you, you know, you had an explosive career. And I'm like, hmm, guess what? It's like Nemo on a current, you know, on his way to Australia and has no idea what he's getting caught up in. That was me in moving here in 1997. Yeah. So we think, we tend to think the career risks we take are all about us. Like I might, it must have been such an oracle. I was not an oracle. I wanted to figure out how to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know that I timed it well, like, come on. <laughs> so sometimes what I got right was the internet. Did I get the magnitude of it right? No, I underestimated it by a factor of like a hundred or a thousand. Or, and so I ended up in a place where there was so many abundant choices that if I failed at one, there was going to be another and another and another. You know, I just was, I had a room, I had so much room to fail and so much room to win because I was just riding a macro trend. So that's, a, that's one choice I talk about. And I think it's really important when we try and find great risks to take. I'm not saying be uncalculated. I'm saying, hey, take into account not just your passions and what you like to do. Step back here, my friends, and figure out what tailwinds you want to ride because riding tailwinds is actually one of the best ways for us to assess what are good and bad risks to take. Um, so, okay. Is that, do you want to share another one or is that the... No, we can wait to share another yeah. one. I've got well, more about the reason that. I asked this, I've had um, 
uh, Scott Galloway, a very pro- polarizing guy, he's been on the show and he said one of the pieces of he advice, pieces of advice he gave to a young person is get to a big city or get to HQ. What do you think about that advice as of this moment today, getting to a big city or getting to HQ headquarters? Well, well first of all, because Scott and I sat on the Urban Outfitters board together for the last really? He just rolled off. So I know Scott. Oh, um, wow. I didn't, yeah, I did not actually, realize that. I will say this to Scott. Scott introduced me to when I had the idea for writing the book. I've had the idea of the book for a while, but a year ago, when I wanted to write the book and I didn't know where to get started, I reached out to Scott because, as I said, we sit on the we sat on the board of Urban Outfitters together. I'm like, Scott, I know you're an amazing author. Like, I want to write a book. And Scott literally introduced me to his agent, who became Jim Levine. Yes, Jim. Levine. Mine too. Jim's my agent. There my you agent? Go. Wow, like, well, what a so small Scott, world. Yes, yeah, so I will email him after this. I'm going to record with Jim when, at the my the time my next book comes out. But that is what a small world. First of all, he's like such a gem of a human being. The I best. Adore Jim. He is the best human being. In oh, world. such a good dude. And he happens to be the best agent also. Yeah. But actually, so Galloway introduced me to Jim. So sorry, I, that's my aside on Galloway. Okay. But coming all the way back, what do I think to Scott? And by the way, Scott's very smart. So. Oh, yeah. Um, I will tell you what I believe um, is right about Scott's wisdom and, and wrong. Um, in the world post-COVID, the, the action used to be in big cities it's not clear if it will again be in big cities. You know what I mean? Like people are literally, we're moving into big cities. I think that post COVID, what we're seeing is a reverse and all the suburbs are starting to get, you know, people en masse as they they decide for themselves that hybrid work is likely to be a reality. So whether the action is still in big cities, I'm not so sure. So that's my, that's the place I would disagree with Scott. Um, I think it may be for the first time in our careers that not being in a big city may actually uh, be more than okay for our career ambitions. Does that make sense? When mm-hmm. more, like all the action is in big cities. Okay. So on the big city front, I'm not sure, but let's come to the HQ comment that, um, that Scott made. Um, like it or not, I think being at the center of the action matters. So, so what do I mean by that? In a world that's virtual, it's kind of hard for all of us, right? Because I don't even know where the center of the action is anymore. Um, but what I do know is that they're understanding the pulse of what matters to an organization is everything. So I'm going to take Scott's comment and I'm going to extrapolate it a little bit. And let's like, let's talk about that idea of like being the virtual AQ, like understanding what the pulse is of the virtual HQ, I think is everything. Because I think when leaders in some ways go awry in execution or what have you, it's because they are so busy focused on their execution that they don't understand the macro environment and tailwinds and headwinds of what's important to an organization. Does that make sense? Yeah. I was talking to people, they're very heads down. So what's the value of being kind of connected to HQ? If you're in like a far office, if you're in a hybrid work environment, if you're three levels down in an organization, you always want to understand like what's the environment and that and that macro headwinds and tailwinds in your own organization so that you understand what the agenda and priorities are and you can fit yourself in that. That's what I call being heads up. So where I agree with Scott is regardless of where we find ourselves physically in the world, the importance of being heads up to really what is the pulse, the heartbeat, the importance, the priorities of HQ is really important. And too often people go awry when they're overly focused on their own execution but they literally cannot fit what they're doing in the context of what is important to the organization. Hmm. Interesting. I just thought of that question based on your, when, when you, as a way you phrased it as um, moving to Silicon Valley, being yeah. kind of in the midst and surrounded by those people. Cause I'm a big believer in your, who, you know, you will yes, rise and I'm, fall yeah. to level, level of your peer group and whether yeah. it's your friends right? Your boss, bosses, mentors, uh, people in your life. So when you put yourself and kind of force that to happen, it seems like it increases your odds of, of good things happening when you're, when you do that. Absolutely. So you were probably taking it a different place and you're right. I always say, put yourself in, you know, prioritize the who over the what, yep. meaning put yourself in the, you know, amidst great people and do great work for great people. It's a very simple philosophy, but it's like, do great work for great people, people from whom you can learn, who admire, who accelerate your own capabilities. And quite frankly, they themselves are talent magnets and, you know, are great to apprentice under. So I think that sometimes, by the way, 
sometimes that ha happens at headquarters, sometimes it doesn't. So, mm -hmm. I, so I think the headquarters point for me is an adjacent but different point, but both are true. Number one, putting like, you know, when I say take a good calculated risk, I think calculated risks that are all about the who are great risks to take. Like if you yeah. say, like, wow, I don't know what's going to happen in this situation, <laughs> but I'm going to work with somebody amazing, you know, who is the best of their field, who can teach me a ton. There's almost no scenario where that's not a great risk to take, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the headquarters point is more about having the pulse of what's going on around you. And sometimes that happens best literally at headquarters, though yeah. we're all living in a world today where that may or may not be possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned single choice. What, what is the, and this is something you, you, you write about in your, in your book, uh, Choose Possibility. What's the myth of single choice? What's that myth I talked about earlier? Like, you know, just how we want to see, I think there are two myths that dominate our life when it comes to risk taking. One is that myth of risk and reward. If I take a big risk, I'm going to get a big reward. If I take a little risk, it's not worth taking. I might as well go home because like little risk, little reward. And so we, we never take the little risks because we think it's all or nothing. Mm -hmm. And we tend to think of it as quite binary, you know, small risk, small reward, big risk, big reward. And it's all going to like, work out magically. That's one myth. The other myth is, is an associated myth, what you call them, and I call the myth of the single choice, which is the world has trained us to believe that the world's biggest risk takers might have, must have made one mighty choice that is responsible for their success. And the corollary of that is, well, if it's one mighty choice to success, if I fail, it's going to be an abysmal failure. I'm going to be made, made or break, broken by one single perfect decision I make. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that undefines me. When it turns out that almost any journey I know is not only non-linear in the risk reward relationship, it's about 10, 20, 50 choices before you unlock a reward or the reward you sought. So we tend to overweight this first choice and it, we make it so big that we never make it because we think it needs to be perfect. When I'm like, what I understand about risk and reward is, you know, the first move is simply like one among 10 or a hundred or a thousand you need to make to unlock success. And it's all about being in a feedback loop of choices. So forget this idea of a single choice and embrace the idea that the journey starts with one choice. But quite frankly, you still have 99 at least more moves to make, you know, to get to where you want to go. So, you know, the myth of the single choice makes us feel like risk is inaccessible because it's one mighty choice and then nothing could be further from the truth. It, it makes me think of a quote you wrote in your book. It's uh, from Samuel Johnson quote, nothing will ever be attempted if all possible and objections must first be overcome. Uh, this is, I think, I, I feel like this is about being decisive and making a choice um, and not having to have, I mean, I think Colin Powell talked about like, basically you're at maximum, you're going to have 70% of the information prior to needing to make a decision, make a call. This is for those people who are always about to do something or, Hey, I'm going to do this, or I'm thinking about this, but then they never actually do it because there will always be objections. Uh, I, I would love for you to speak to those. People. We're all that, that person probably at, at, from time to time, speak to that person who has this big thing they want to do, or even a little thing they want to do, but there's an objection or there are objections that they can't fully answer. So they just do nothing. What, what advice to that person? Well, yeah, a couple of things. Well, first of all, um, I think we think that when we do nothing, there's no cost. Mm -hmm. And we think like we can be static and the opportunity will be there tomorrow. Well, what we've learned, you know, what I've learned in a, ton, a number of business negotiations, including deals that I was waiting to make happen and they never happened because by the time I was ready to do the deal, the partner had moved on or found a competitor or quite frankly, their own business circumstances had changed. And now the deal they wanted to do was not one I could afford, right? I've lived the world of biz dev negotiations where you think if I do the deal tomorrow, it'll still be here. And often that same deal is not available to you. But in our life, it's the same. We think that if we wait, the same choice will be available to us tomorrow. And every condition around us is changing. So there's an absolute cost to staying still, right? There's just an absolute cost. So to somebody who says, I'm not going to make a choice today because I can make it tomorrow, that may, that, that may well not be true. And to the person who says, I'm not going to make a choice today that's small because I could make a bigger one tomorrow, I'd say like, 
okay, well, if you're not good at making small choices, what makes you think you're going to be great at making big choices? I'm like, hey, exercise that muscle, get good at making small choices, practice taking little risks, deal with little uncertainties, because me, that's the best way you train for the day the big choice comes. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you just have more experience and data and pattern recognition. So I feel like when people kick the can down the curb, to your point, it's not because they fear the upside. They know the upside, right? They fear the downside. And I'm like, okay, well, what if I told you the downside of stasis is worse? Mm -hmm. um, and the downside of, you know, the downside of waiting, waiting for the big decision is like, you're actually going to be a poorer risk taker than somebody who practices taking little risks every day. So I, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite convinced that the way we get good about choice making is we practice like anything else. You, you've written about becoming a smart risk taker. And I want to think about this, Segunda, from two angles. One, for an individual within a mm -hmm. business, yeah. maybe they're in a leadership role for themselves in their own career. And then separately, for someone who's leading a large team of people of creating, I know these are two big kind of separate questions, but I know you can tackle both. But for that second person, it's they're leading a big organization, maybe they're an SVP or in that role, and they have hundreds of people that roll up to them and they want to build a culture of risk-taking, of innovation, of making something happen, of not standing still. So let's start with the individual first and maybe tackle the, the, the leadership position one second when people report to them, because I think this is a, a, a big key for you is how to become a smart risk-taker. Absolutely, and I think you, um... You noted that's so important. And by the way, if you want to know what kind of a risk taker you are naturally, you can go to the website for the book, Choose Possibility. And there's a simple risk quiz you can take that helps you sort of identify what kind of a, maybe your natural style of choice making. So that's a fun thing for you to do if you'd ever like, like to figure that out about yourself. Choosepossibility.com, right? Yeah. And there's yep. a risk quiz. Risk on quiz. Yep. Yeah. Which would be okay. really fun. So for the individual, I think, who is sort of thinking about the, becoming a calculated risk taker, right? Not a rash risk taker, but a calculated one. I always say there are four big things that we need to know to be smart risk takers. Number one, clearly, what are our, you know, what are our goals, passions, and values, right? Um, and so, of course, you, you know, we can identify our goals. My goal is to become a CEO. My goal, that's one piece of it, right? But the other things we need to know about ourselves are what are we uniquely great at? Because when we align our choices with what we are uniquely gifted at, right, we increase our probability to success. And that third part of what I call that self-awareness sandwich is like, what are our values? Because again, when we go to environments where we align our values, with the organization that we're a part of. So, you know, we bring complementary strengths to that organization or to that company, but while our values are aligned, we feel safe to contribute, right? We feel safe to take more risks. So that's one piece of it. So as an individual, the second thing I often say to people, if you wanna be a smart risk taker is look for those headwinds and tailwinds and you find opportunities in both, right? But you want to align yourself with, in the case of tailwinds, let's say companies or divisions or industries where there's momentum because there's a lot of room to succeed. Does that make sense? By the way, there's also room to fail because if you're getting something big right, you can afford to get make a lot of mistakes and you know the overall trajectory will still be up and to the right. How do you see so, that though? That it's see, like looking back, it's yeah. like, wow, what a brilliant choice you made to move where you did, when you did, with the rise of the internet. There's, as you already mentioned, there's, there's definitely a luck component for like, how do you, how, is there a, a way to, to become better at kind of getting sure. in front of that? Like, what do you think? Well, let's put, let's put the best thing for a risk taker is, or if somebody wants to get a, be better at risk taking is, I'm not saying you need to be an Oracle. I'm not saying predict the trend. I'm just saying, identify it. And you can yeah. easily see it. Like, if you're thinking about joining a company, what rate are they growing at? Yeah. Ask them why. If so, your boss is trying to convince you, you know, to go to a smaller division and you're like, oh, that really sucks. I'm in this big stable job, but your division's growing at 1% and that thing's growing at 50%. Ask yourself why, like maybe they're not trying to demote you, but give you an opportunity to ride a tailwind, mm. you know? So, and Satya Patel, Satya Patel, Satya Nadella did that at Microsoft. Like he took an old state division and he became CEO because he figured out the cloud, the cloud division, which he had under him and people were afraid of because it was going to cannibalize Microsoft's big business. He was the guy who figured out like, while I have a whole business, I'm going to take this part that can cannibalize the rest and I'm going to grow it faster and give it resources and not worry about the other part of the 
business that is stable, the server business. Mm. Guess what? That became Microsoft Azure. And Microsoft Azure put Satya Nadella in the CEO seat at Microsoft. It was like his earmark, right? And he took a small division that nobody else wanted to take because it was risky. And he put more resources into it as opposed to fearing that it was cannibalizing the big, slower growing business. So that's an example. That's a gr- the good news is. Yeah, I want to pause for a second because that's big. Uh, this is something I didn't think of earlier in my career. Probably I just wasn't smart enough to really think or I didn't think at all. But this is an important point to make, like, keep your eyes open, whether it's within your own business or a different one of understanding growth and momentum, and putting, putting yourself in a position of opportunity to be because I know people say like, Oh, well, yeah, you worked there when it was easier, because it was just growing like this. My dad always told me like, yeah, I worked at this business, when we would roll out of bed, and it would grow 25%. Those were the good old days. Yeah. Or, but to credit to him that he found the place in the right industry and he did it right it's not it, it, i think that's well, yeah, thing. Like, i mean we call we call that being lucky i would say okay guys like if there's external momentum and you want to make a calculate calculated choice don't you think going somewhere where there's momentum yeah. and that means your job naturally rises you have maybe more cash flow to experiment like is there anything wrong with that like and you, you know, usually yeah. don't cut jobs at places like that, right? You don't have to, the, the, the October cuts where I've worked at a place where that happened before because we were growing like 1%. And I was like, God, this, this is not fun. I, all my friends well, are getting laid off. Yeah. I, I, and I, I'll say be attuned to both because when you say, can I ride, can I win in a tailwind, in a situation with headwinds? The answer is yes, yeah. if you understand what winning means. So often if you're, let's say you're in a headwind situation where a company is not growing fast, whatever. I went to StubHub. StubHub was not growing very fast when I went. But my opportunity to change, pivot, try new things. I had license to do that because we were trying to figure it out, right? So I had an opportunity to learn because, you know, we needed to do that. By the way, in sometimes in headwind situations, you don't have the luxury of being able to hire who you want. So guess what? You ask for more responsibility. Mm -hmm. You, You know, those are the situations in which we quite frankly learn to deal with adversity, you know, which by the way, is the number one skill that recruiters want to recruit for on LinkedIn. Think about that agility and adversity. They want people who know how to be agile and deal with adversity. Um, So it actually weirdly, even in headwind situations, we find opportunity, but the point is read the tea leaves and go to where the opportunity is In in headwind situations. It's disproportionate learning. Do you know what I mean? Like somebody may give you the shot because nobody else will take the shot. In the tailwind situation, it's like momentum, just pure momentum and your ability to have license to, you know, try more in that environment. Hmm. Um, so that's a big one. Like I say to individuals all the time, we, like, you have to be reading the macro environment. It's not actually all about you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How about, how about for the leader? Maybe you even did this when you were at StubHub. You're the president of StubHub, correct? Yes. yes I so you, I, I, I am kind of curious about like, uh, how that all came about, how they came and got you, why you said yes, and then maybe how you built or tried to build a culture where people were willing uh, to take risks, to try to innovate, or you, or to take smart risk within the environment with which you led. That's uh, happy, happy to go there. One last thing on just for individuals, we talked about knowing who you are and finding alignment with who you are, right, and your goals. Number two, we talked about headwinds and tailwinds. The third one that's really important is what we talked about before. Uh, over prioritize the who versus the what in your choices mm. when we go to environments where we can apprentice and learn and get proximate to people who give us learning faster they also often expose us to opportunities faster than we would see them ourselves so that was okay. the one on the individual side so coming to the stub hub um, part of my journey first of all i went to stub hub it was a calculated risk for me um i went to stub hub for two reasons Uh, Number one, I had spent the last 10 years as an e-commerce entrepreneur. I left Google in 2010 and I, you know, started a company called Joyous. I was CEO of a company called Polywar, which is like an early version of Pinterest that Yahoo bought. And I, and I become an e-commerce board member and investor and immersed myself in e-commerce. So after doing that for seven years, I really missed running a company of pretty significant scale. I missed, you know, the complexity, the leadership challenges. And so after we sold my small company, Joyous, I really um, said to myself, I'm going to go back to finding a leadership opportunity at a platform that's big, where I can impact millions of customers, you know, lead a large organization, you know, enjoy that side of my brain. 
Um, and I think I got the nod at StubHub because it needed the combination of entrepreneurial energy and executive energy I had to expend, right? So eBay had held it for 10 years, StubHub, great brand, but in an increasingly, increasingly competitive ticketing environment, you know, top Livation Ticketmaster, the behemoth, StubHub had a bunch of um, competitors that had grown from nowhere to half its size. So feeling competitive heat everywhere, um, an organization had been within eBay. So, you know, eBay really wanted somebody, I think, who could be innovative and entrepreneurial, but understood, like, you're dealing with a large scale operation. And so for them, I think the combination of my Google experience and executive experience fit. And I went there because it was a chance for me to lead, uh, you know, a uh, well-recognized consumer brand, give people delight, which gives me a lot of joy as a company to build, you know, give people live experiences. It's a pretty fun business to run. And for me, it was my path back as a calculated risk to being in a larger corporate environment, yet still getting to be a CEO of an independent business. So it was a good calculated risk for me to take, right, um, on that dimension. So that's why I took the job. In terms of what I was trying to do at StubHub to create an environment in which people can take risk, which I think is particularly relevant to this conversation because StubHub had, been, had not been an independently owned company and startup for 10 years. It had been a part of eBay, right? Um, and part of the eBay culture. I think there are two or three things that I focused on doing that I think that leaders in general can think about for their own organization. First and foremost, is, you know, I think you want to create an environment in which people can be truth tellers, truth seekers, and authors. So what do I mean by that? If we want people to take risks, right, what does every CEO want or every founder want? They want, they, they wish everybody woke up obsessing about the business the same way they do and willing, and in the case of a founder, which I've been, willing to take as many risks as they would take to make their baby successful. Yet most people wake up every day wondering if their leaders really want them to speak up, do they really want them to ask questions? <laughs> Do they really want a debate in the conversation? Do they really want a new idea to be presented and you know, interrupt the flow of how the organization works? You have to create a construct in which people feel very comfortable, right? Doing, doing those things. And, and I'd say the best way I know to, you to do that, know to do that as a leader is you have to make it safe in little ways. Like if you just say to an organization that never takes risks, take big risks, it's the same thing. Who's gonna do that? It feels very risky. <laughs> but if you say to an organization, I'm gonna demonstrate to you every day that when people take little risks in anything, in a meeting, in anything, that I'm gonna start rewarding that behavior because what everybody does is they watch to see what's rewarded in an organization. Um, so I'll give you a really little example at StubHub, um, two examples that, of things I did. Number one, when I got there, you know, most companies run planning processes and they only wanna run them with the top part of the organization. Yet one thing you should recognize when you're a leader of any organization is the real work and the real ideas might be happening two levels beneath your VP level, right? It's not the person who's telling people like who's managing, it's the person who's doing. Like, so, you know, if you look at the business, like they were probably, if I looked below the VP and director level or even the VP level at StubHub, there were probably a hundred people that were running key parts of the organization that could impact what we do next. So I set up our OKR process from the very beginning. I was like, uh, I want to meet with all 100. I'm going to get rid of like, so our, our planning process ended up invoking about 100 people because I wanted to go to the two levels deep in the organization where the ideas were happening. And I wanted to see them in the room directly presenting their ideas. I would get to learn them better. They would get the, they're the people who are the authors, right? Like they probably know best what we should do to reinvent our customer to customer selling Part like of a, a frontline obsession. Chris Zook said yeah. that on this show. Yeah, from right? like yeah. Who's the product lead? Who's the person yeah. owning like the five to seven engineers that are containing, you know, working this part of the business? They're going to know the answer on maybe have the best ideas of what to do. So in our planning process, we literally expanded the number of people we bought into quarterly planning. You know, I was like, I'm not going by hierarchy. I want to go by who's leading the teams that touch every part of the key flows to the company. Hmm. And so we expanded to 100 and we invited all 100 into the room in our quarterly planning process. And I'm like, and, and I wanted, and a big portion of those people would present their ideas directly. It wasn't like their leader was presenting the idea because I wanted everybody to watch the debate and be part of the debate, right? So not every, all 100%. But if you're in the room watching the dynamic and debate and seeing that the person who authored the idea gets a chance to present it, maybe you feel like you can author too. So that's mm -hmm. one example of what we did. 
And then another one that I think is really important as a leader in any dimension, whether you have 100 people in the room, whether you have five people in the room, is watch what you validate by your actions. So I remember one of our quarterly planning sessions, um, we had this really smart woman who was new and was um, presenting how the numbers were going on one new business we were trying. Cause we had a, you know, we created an area of the business where we we're just incub incubating new services. And she was probably three or four months into the organization. And so she was presenting the numbers in her business plan for the next quarter. And our CFO, who was a pretty extroverted character like me, and, you know, I'd say, you know, the two of us were always joking in meetings or whatever. Lots of people would defer to us, obviously. He starts asking her like really pointed questions and just firing off at her. Well, what about this? What about this? And she stands her ground and she, and, you know, and she answers him with confidence and assertion and sort of, you know, just keeps ticking through like, isn't she, isn't sway that just keeps ticking through her data and gives him a rebuttal for every one of his key questions. Very well done. So that finishes and you'd say, okay, well, that's the interaction. But then I'm thinking like, I'm the CEO. So I just chuckle in that moment and in the whole room and it's not like I'm so perfect, but in the whole room, I was like, I was like, you go girl, way to give it to Greg. Like, look at that, Greg. And everybody in the room starts laughing. But in that moment, what I'm doing is validating, like, good for you. Like, yeah, you go tell our CEO. You had a reason. You, you, so you were in the moment thinking you did this for a purpose. You were intentional with your right. actions. Yeah. Yeah. I'm intentional in that I understand that when I'm the leader in the room, everybody's looking to see how I react. For sure. and what I want to do is validate that activity. That's the way I wish every young person would stand up and like defend their ideas. And it doesn't matter if you're talking to the CFO of the company, like that's validating that you can meet him as a peer and have conviction in your ideas and your data and your capabilities. And that that action is what we want to see more of. Right. Hmm. So I think that on our little actions, people take away what is acceptable or not. So I always say, like, honor the truth tellers, honor the questioners, honor the authors in every little way you see it happen. Call it out. And it doesn't have to be a big speech. It's just like a funny joke or, you know, or a, hey, that's awesome. Like and move on. But people are, are reading from our actions what we actually value. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. And you kind of prove that this is a type of culture we're building. It's safe to do this, right? There's a lot written out there on psychological safety. This is the leader proving that, yes, you can do that here. And but to be clear, she was proving it was, it was, doing she proved all. it. You validated it. All I'm trying to do as a leader is validate the behaviors yeah. that let other people know it's safe to do this. And not only is it safe, we're going to celebrate when you do this. How about, um, uh, let's talk about for an individual going for a job. And I think this may be a male female thing. I think this, the science would back this up that guys tend to not worry about going for a big job that they're not qualified for, but women seem to be more concerned about that. Again, I'm, I, I don't have the research off the top of my head, but I have read about that. I'm but sure were, you, yes, that women tend to think they're underqualified. And men right. Tend to be overqualified. right. So speaking to both uh, guys and girls here, what, what, what are your thoughts on going for a big job that you, you, you may not be specifically qualified for? Uh, well, I think that this is one of the risks worth taking to your mm -hmm. point, because I say, um, and there's research to support this, which we'll come to a moment. We think that we have the most impact when we stick with what we know. And to some degree, by the way, if you look at Malcolm Gladwell, you know, be an expert, there's lots to suggest that as you keep building competency at something and keep doing the same thing, you grow, right? And you have more impact, right? You get more skilled. So it's not that I don't believe that you shouldn't go after things that you're specialized in or qualified for, but there's this break point when the next level of impact you can have and the next level of learning is engaging the thing you don't know. It's getting breadth of experience, not just depth, right? So de facto, let's just think about that for a moment de facto for you to learn, it means you don't know something. <laughs> so when somebody offers you a job for which you're not qualified, they're offering you the opportunity to accelerate your learning, right? To accelerate your learning. And while we go into those environments and think like, I'm not qualified, the reality is we typically will learn at an accelerated rate. And the impact we unlock, and this is really important, is LinkedIn and others have done a story. There's a New York Times article that I quote in the book that the path to the CEO job is a winding one. There is research to support that today what's valued by companies is depth of experience, but breadth of functional experience. Because if you wanna be a CEO, 
you can't just be good at one thing, right? You have to prove that you're capable of understanding five parts of an organization. You have to prove that if you ran engineering, you're capable of understanding product enough to be a leader of it. So how do you ever acquire all the skills necessary to be a great leader if you don't expand your skill set to the things you don't know? So coming all the way back, when people say, I, like, somebody's offered me a job I'm not qualified for, I'm like, okay, first of all, that's your path to accelerated learning. Number two, research would suggest that if you actually want to get into the top job, you need not only depth of experience, but breadth of experience. And, and that the best job, the, the best path, as the New York Times says to the CEO job, is a winding one where people literally have experimented and tried different functions, right, adjacent to what they know to expand their capabilities and their learning. And it turns out that will expand to have your ability to have impact too. So mostly what I say is like the best risk worth taking are the risk to learn. Because not only, you know, do you kind of get more satisfaction and improve your own growth curve, Turns out that that breadth is actually what people are seeking when they're looking for people who can ascend all the way to the top. What about leaving a job? There, are, There's someone right now uh, working out in the morning thinking, I want to leave my job, uh, mm -hmm. but this is a risk. I'm not sure if I should leave, right? And you've, you've, you've certainly done this. What, how do you know when it's the right time to leave a job? Well, for me, I actually try and measure my... Um, measure any situation in my own career in like call it three to five three to five year sprints i know there's some people who don't measure them or measure them in 20 i take three to five because in three to five years at anything i want to a achieve some ambition maybe it's a title maybe it's wealth maybe it's you know maybe it's learning i want to have enough time at something to know that i can have an impact right and that impact will unlock a future opportunity so it's very hard to have impact if you want to be at something for six months, like good luck with that. I don't know any careers that are built by like six months of impact because you can't really learn enough to deliver enough, right? But let's just agree that in three to five year sprints, a history would suggest that, you know, you can achieve some meaningful ambition in those, in those leaps. So first of all, I'd say to you, where are you in that cycle? And if you're thinking about leaving, you're either thinking about leaving because you're not having fun or you're not having impact or likely both. Mm -hmm. And so I think, first of all, before you leave, diagnose, why are you not having the impact you want? And sometimes when we're not having the impact that we want, we can go back to all that criteria I mentioned, right? Who are you with? Are your values aligned? Are you in a macro situation that will allow you to be successful at your job or thrive at your job, right? These are, and then, and then lastly, you know, if you're, if you, you can, you have to evaluate those macro conditions and say, am I not having fun for these reasons? And then lastly, what is your contribution to that situation, which is a pretty big, you know, pretty big deal, as you know. Mm -hmm. So you want to evaluate the conditions you're, you've put yourself in. Who are you with? How do they align with your values and strengths, the job that you're doing? And like, is the macro condition conducive to your success? If not, what would you pivot within your job to try and find more ability to contribute and have success? How, which of those conditions would you change? Last and most important of which is your own contribution, right? So that's like, what are the things you're doing every day to maximize your impact. So I will say to people, is it time to leave? The first question is, um, why are you not having impact at your, in your current situation? Because usually when we have impact, we have fun. Or why are you not having fun, but impact? Like what's missing for you? Maybe it's passion. Maybe it's like, you just don't enjoy the job, even if you're good at it, which comes back to who you are and what you value. And then number two, if you're not having fun and impact, you know, the question is like, have you talked out? In the organization you're in, have you topped out? And I would say we've often topped out if we're fundamentally in an organization that doesn't fit with our values and doesn't have any room for our strengths or value our strengths. But if you're in a place where the, your values and strengths fit, the question is like, could you be doing more? You know, does the environment, like, is there no more to learn? Have you, and sometimes we just topped out because there's just no more to learn, you know, and that may be a chance to move on. But I always look at that, where you are in that five, three to five year cycle, why are you not having impact? Diagnose, use the choice and the framework I gave you to diagnose. Is it the environment? Is it the people? Is it you? Is it you in the context of your values and strengths? And then like, what could you be doing to have more impact? And if the answer is you've done it all and nothing, like you've diagnosed and there's nothing more, then you may be at a natural ending point. Hmm. But so many people want to jump without diagnosing. And yeah. I think that we could cut short our impact in an organization. Other places, by the way, it's just done. I mean, I was a founder and co-founder and, um, you know, SVP of, of Yodely 
for five years. The company took 15 years to get public. I left at year five. I feel very good about that decision. Like I had done every job, but the CEO's job, every mm -hmm. single job. The company was not growing fast enough for it to produce new learning opportunity for me. And the CEO job was filled, by the way, with a guy I was very happy with who stayed there for the next 10 years. Hmm. There was no more for me to learn. Like it wasn't growing fast enough to be spawning new learning opportunities. And I left. Hmm. Um, so sometimes we are just topped out. I topped out at five years in that organization. By the way, Google, I could have stayed for another 10 and probably had five more careers at Google. I wanted to achieve a new ambition to be a CEO. That ambition was not available at Google. I was not going to be Google CEO. By the way, none were, not, neither were any of my peers. We were all business people, and it was going to be led by a technologist or a product leader, and that's what ended up happening. So, mm. right, so there was one ambition Google could never give me, which was being a CEO. Why was that an ambition of yours? Uh, probably half ego. Um, you know, this notion of like... Uh, Am I just lucky to be here or am I capable of, you know, of leading and building an organization that can achieve impact? So one could call that ego. The other half of that is purpose. Like I am built to drive and lead. And I, I guess I always get joy from challenging myself at the next leadership level. Sometimes for some people, that's about scale. For some people, that's about complexity. For some people, it's about being the ultimately accountable person. And for me, it's probably all three. I get enjoy scale, I enjoy complexity. I also just enjoy being on the hook. Like there's a leadership pressure and challenge that said for good or for bad, the buck stops with me. Um, and I guess that was something that I, I wanted and thrived in and not just for ego reasons, like just like it, it's what drives me. It gives me purpose and meaning. And yeah. like I'm you, you, impact. you love the responsibility that comes with that leadership role. I sense. I do. I do. Yeah. I do. And cool. don't get me wrong. Sometimes it sucks and it's scary. And when you fail, like everybody looks to you and it's you. Yeah. Um, but, but there's also, like I said, I also thrive in feeling like I wake up every day and I understand exactly what my purpose is. And I feel like I'm maximizing my leadership capacity and capability. And maybe that's the gift I want to maximize. Hmm. I, I, I just really, I, I personally, Sekundra, I identify with that. I played quarterback when I played football. And the reason I chose that and continue to play it and even transfer to continue playing that position when they tried to move me at the first place I went is because I love that part of it. I love the fact that if I play well, we're probably going to win. And if I play bad, we're probably going to lose. I, I just think that's a, I love that responsibility, even though there are moments when it's the worst, you throw in a game losing interception, they return it for a touchdown and you lose. And you're like, that's because of me. Yeah. yeah. No, it's all true. Right. I mean, yeah, it's brutal, it's, but it's like, but the highs are so, I don't know. Like it's hard to, I just, yeah, I the highs are high and that, you know, the lows are incredibly low. And so yeah. anyway, we're all built differently and for different purposes and yeah, for, for good or for bad. So my point is like, I have left journeys that have been amazing, even though yeah. that me, what I wanted next was not achievable there. Yeah. But that's different from leaving when we have failed to have the impact we are capable of having. Yeah, good point. By the way, you, the only frustrating times to leave are when you really leave because you can fail. Like, even if you fail with the goal, if you fail to have impact, it's a particularly heartbreaking type of departure. Yeah. And I've had that happen too. You, you spent time around some amazing leaders who have impacted the world. You're also one of those people. What have you found to be some of the, the common characteristics of leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time? I think that is a great question. I think leaders who sustain excellence over a long period of time do one thing particularly well. They surround themselves with other great people um, and they never let their ego get in the way of finding, you know, recruiting, retaining the best talent to meet the goal and exceed the goal. And leaders who fail to sustain or leaders who, and there's other things that fail too, but leaders who I admire the most, you know, are leaders who never feel threatened by the level of talent and excellence around them. They realize that the entire game improves and they improve. They just move on to their next goal or ambition because they're able to, you know, surround themselves with other great talent, including peers. I mean, I know leaders who have recruited people who have done multiple times better than them, by the way. I've recruited people who, you know, gone on to have more success than I have. And I don't look, look at that as a badge of failure. I look at that as like, wow, like, first of all, how lucky that I was able to work with this person. 
Um, and number two, like that allowed me to go on and do new great things because I was able to work with them. So um, that means that that requires a level of humility and understanding that it isn't all about us. And when we, we don't look great because of who we control, I would say we look great because of the people we enable and empower. Mm. Um, yeah, you become mm. more, yeah. I love it. Uh, one more, you got time for one more question? One more, yeah, go for it. There, for someone who has recently graduated college, maybe. Yep earlier in their career, not 100% sure what they want to do yet, but they definitely want to leave a dent, right? They want to impact people in a positive way. They, they want to be a, a, a person who, who does well in the world, right? Yeah. Leaves, a, leaves an impact, as you said. What are some general pieces of career slash life advice for that person? So a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, we tend to assume that everything is zero sum game. You know, we talked about this. Like if I make a great choice, that means you make a poor choice. If I have more, you have less. And I will tell you, and I think this is so important. One of the things you're gonna find is that possibility, choice, power, these things are abundant. So I know you think if somebody else, if your classmate gets more, you get less. We've been set up to think that there's like scarcity and one of the things I want to tell you is there's abundance. Like you will find that whatever choice you make, it doesn't mean that the person beside you needs to make a losing choice for you to make a winning choice. If somebody besides you makes a winning choice, it doesn't mean you, you're left with the leftovers. That's just not how the world works. The good news is, is when we make choices for ourselves and generate any kind of impact, we get the opportunity to make more choices. And so we find that we can regenerate our own opportunities quite quickly if we're focused on this continuum of, Make a choice, whatever it is, focus on impact. Whether you fail or succeed, focus on impact. Then you get to make another choice and another one and another one and learn from every choice. And it's a like choice is a multiplier of opportunity and you control it. Nobody else does. That's probably the singular most important thing because we've been trained to think if you get it, I don't. If you get the job, I don't get the job. If you win, I fail. It's just not like that. The good news is you can generate choices for yourself by just continuing to focus on impact. That's one. Number two is like, you think the first move matters most. The thing that matters is make a choice and get in motion. Because as we talked about on this podcast, choosing possibility is not about one great choice. It's about every choice begets data, learning, maybe success. And in any event, it leads to the next choice. So what you wanna do is just get yourself on that path by staying aligned to some of those first principles we talked about of making good choices there, you know, but it doesn't need to be a perfect choice. Just get on the continuum of, of choice, make a, you know, do your best to make a first good one and then recognize you have, you have a hundred, a thousand more choices to make. And that should be freeing rather than paralyzing. Mm. I love it. Have a bias for action. Uh, so good. Sekinder, the book is called Choose Possibility, Take Risk and Thrive Even When You Fail. Uh, where else would you send my viewers and listeners to learn more about you online? Uh, well, I hang out most on LinkedIn, so you can always find me on LinkedIn and follow me there. And that's where I post most actively. I'm on Twitter too. Um, and as I often say, I'm on Instagram, but I hide. It's just one more channel to manage. And mostly, <laughs> mostly I'd rather look at other people's photos. So, uh, but uh, LinkedIn and Twitter are always great places to find me. Awesome. Well, love the book. Love what you stand for. And certainly uh, would love to continue our dialogue as we both progress. I loved it too. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.